Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer Podcast. We are on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And if you're listening to us right now on iTunes, please go and leave a five-star review. I read the best reviews every week so long as they are five stars. I want to let you guys know about stand-up I'm doing. My domestic terrorist tour. I'm going to be in Bethel, PA at Pat Garrett Amphitheater with the comedians of the compound this Friday, June 18th. For tickets, go to my website, chrissymayer.com, or I believe compoundcomedy.com is another source uh, where you can get tickets for compound media comedy events. I'm also going to be on the Jersey Shore next month uh, in July. Uh, I'll be at Uncle Vinny's July 17th and Jinx on the boardwalk July 20th. Tickets for those events should also be in my website as well. Uh, And then I'm going to be in New Orleans uh, August 18th and I'm sorry, August 13th and 14th, Vegas September 10th and 11th, and then back to Dallas, Texas uh, September 17th and 18th. Very excited for all those dates. Also very excited to talk to you guys about Cushy Dreams. Cushy Dreams is my go-to source for CBD products. They are the best. Uh, They offer a full lineup of premium smokable CBD. They specialize in CBD hemp flower, a.k.a. bud in cans, and also pre-roll CBD joints. I personally really like the pre-rolls because they're like, kind of clean and tidy. I don't have to like pack a bowl per se. Uh, You can enjoy all the health benefits of CBD without getting high. These products have under 0.3% THC. It's cannabis that ships directly to you and it's legal in all 50 states. Join the men and women who are sick of vapes and gummies and want to smoke their CBD. It looks, feels, smells just like high quality marijuana, uh, but it's not going to get you high. They take the artisan approach. Every run is in a small batch. Each batch is slow cured for two to four weeks to guarantee maximum freshness and preserve flavor and cannabinoids. And best of all, it's grown here in the USA. Cushy Dreams has CBD flour and pre-rolls in specific indica and sativa blends like Energy Hustle, Relax, dream, create. So whatever you want to do with your day, if you want to be a little bit more up, you want to be a little bit more relaxed, Cushy Dreams has your back. Go to cushydreams.com and use promo code CMP at checkout. You are going to get 20% off every order and smoke your CBD. Get relaxed, boys and girls. Okay. I'm so excited to have this guy on the podcast. Uh, He's very handsome, very funny, very cool. You guys are going to love him. It's comedian Terry McNeely. What What up? (laughs) Terry, how have you been? How has your how have you been dealing over the last, I guess, year and several months now as this pandemic has dragged on? Uh yeah. It's a really tiring waiting around in the basement uh for stimulus checks so I could buy bourbon I couldn't afford before the stimulus check. <laughs> what kind of bourbon do you drink? Uh well, day to day, Jim Beam. You know, I'm not a snob, but uh, I finally got to afford uh, Basil Hayden's and the good stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah, I usually just go to like, I mean, my boyfriend drinks the brown liquor. So I just ultimately just ask whoever's working behind the counter. So they could be selling me on like garbage. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm more of a vodka girl, more of a white claw girl myself. Um, how long have you been doing comedy now? 15 years. Woo! Okay. So you probably have a lot to say on, like, I feel like there was a sort of gold, not golden age of comedy. I feel like the early aughts. Has it been getting, I want to know, how have you been adjusting as things have become more digital, as social media has become more of like a second full-time job you need to have as a comedian? How have you been adjusting to that? Well, if they would stop taking my accounts away and putting me... (laughs) in jail for Facebook for, for 100 days. <laughs> I'm way two of my uh, Instagrams. Now I'm off I'm off Instagram again. I had 30,000 followers. Five. I, I had 30,000. They took me off. I said something about Ileana Omar. I was gone. And then uh, I was actually, I'm actually friends with uh, Tina Forte, the, the, the psycho of the Trump 2020 football. I love Tina. Tina's been on Great. the show. Yeah. T- I love lot. Tina. I, I came back to Instagram. She started sharing all my shit for me, and I got back up to 15.5, and now I'm gone again. The day before the election, my my Instagram went white screen. What? Parking lot, about to go in and get a shirt or two. 
and I just refreshed and it went whoosh, white gone forever. That I, is I, back on. That's kind of similar to what happened in my first Instagram account. Uh, just my regular Chrissy Mayer account. Like I was just sharing something into my stories that was a little bit like anti jab, but I wasn't like commenting on it. I just was like, this is interesting. And it was a video of like a scientist that of course uh, was censored because they weren't state approved. Um, and I, I was really amazed. I was like, I was kind of like you. I will. I only had thirteen point three thousand, but it's still like significant. It helps. It helps you sell tickets. It helps you oh. promote your stuff. I find Twitter really doesn't help me too much, which is odd, because uh, I have a decent following there. But most of the times when I go to a show, it's people will come over and go, "Hey, I follow you on Facebook," or "Hey, I saw this. This day was was in advertised on uh, Instagram." We did a tour two two Mays ago. Uh, the multiple personalities thing. I'm 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 involved with it now with uh, the guys. Most of the guys from AC Jokes. Mike, oh Mike. yes, I know those guys. So how many personalities are you bringing to the table? Adam, Adam <laughs> Gay. Yeah. So we went on a we being me, Gary, and Mike went on a, like a three week tour, and everybody that was coming up to us, like sitting there that we didn't know, I would go outside and smoke a cigarette, and Mike Merck would come over and go. That whole those three tables were all from your Instagram, and I'm like, oh. wow. So Instagram worked. Twitter doesn't, you know, once in a while, some guy will show up. Hey, follow you on Twitter. Maybe you need to post more, like, semi-nudes. <laughs> to see that. <laughs> to show them what they're missing. Yeah. Yeah. So, keep taking you off. Like, if you if you think a, a specific way, you're gone. So, you got, so the times you've been censored and banned and suspended, it was talking about Ilhan Omar... Um, what else was it that got you uh, off? Uh, anything. I always find it funny when you, you'll share a video or a meme from somebody and their, their accounts on, and the next morning you're gone. Yeah. And they're still there. They're I, fine. I stole it from this kid, Jimmy, Jimmy's still on and I'm, I'm gone. That's why I think they actually target like certain accounts. Of course they do. Yeah. I, and they want to target you before you get too big. Like Anthony's Twitter. I'm like, they're, they're all over him. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Cause you've been on compound media. Yeah. Have you done Anthony's show or, yeah. uh, Oh, that was great. After George Gallo hit his, uh, his saw losers, uh, shut the fuck up video that went viral. He invited me and George on. That was a lot of fun. I did Gavin's show even before that. Oh, wow. Uh, uh Gavin was before my time on there. I wish I, oh, I was shit. there for him. He's so funny. Um, okay. So let me talk. So you started comedy. Okay. Let's see. Maybe, Four years before me, so that was what, like, oh, that was in a writing class. I was a UPS guy. You got, were wow. Yes, I have a pension, so I, I, I went out the night before. I did a little partying and went home and slept for like forty minutes. Got in the truck, drove out to the Hamptons where my route was, so I had to deliver like P Diddy and Spielberg and Chevy Chase. For real? Yeah, yeah. What did you <laughs> deliver to them? UPS packages, like. Oh, you didn't know what was inside. Joel, and then Billy Joel sold his house to Seinfeld. So I, I, I literally knocked on the same door and met them both at two different times. Wow. So I got I got out of the truck to get a bacon, egg, and cheese like every, every guy does in, that works in New York and New Jersey. And I got I didn't put my seatbelt back on. I got back in the truck. I fell asleep. And I smashed into a Subaru, which smashed into a Volvo, which smashed into a BMW. Oh, no. Car accident. And then the girl I was with at the time basically was like, you, you, you just lost your job. You're out of here. But that was funny because I was I was union, so I, had, they, I left with a pension. They couldn't fire me. I had to quit. No, oh, wow. Nice. Quitting. So then I went to see Ted Alexandro, at, uh, which I love. He's nothing, so funny. Nothing like me, but he's like, that's one of my, I'm a huge fan of his. I went to see him at Governor's, and then there was a thing on the table. You think you're funny? Take eight weeks of comedy class. Da, da, da. And so the eighth class, the eighth week was you do a show. And my teacher was Carrie Caravis, who's freaking amazing. Oh, Carrie, she's great. Oh, yeah. The the mouth of the East. Oh, yeah. She's a oh. real sassy broad. I uh, love her. She was, it was like tough love. If you went in there, you had to go out, you had to show up there. And like, if you had new jokes, you'd run them by her. And then so she'd be like, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Don't ever <laughs> out of your fucking mouth ever again. It's so stupid. You can't that funny, you know? I was like, oh, okay. So I was actually learning stuff. I don't want to teach her. It goes, everything you say is brilliant. Everything. So she would say when it's shit and when she said it was good. So I proceeded to take eight more classes. 
That's yeah. great because you don't want somebody to sugarcoat it. No, no, no. I want when you get out in front of a real crowd, like they'll let you know. Yeah, no, I want to be, you know, tough love. I want to be verbally abused if I'm being a shithead like my dad used to do when I was growing up. What was the nugget or what was the moment that like that made you realize like, oh, I'm funny. Like I think I might want to do stand up. My friends dared me to take the class. This is what happened right, right before, just when the no smoking in bars law hit in, in 03. I would go outside with my best friend, Dave DeVito at the time, and we'd be smoking and I would just be like ripping on him and cutting on him and stuff. And then some guy would over the corner be like, dude, they would be like laughing. I'm like, Yo, you should be, you should be, you, are you a comedian? I go, no, I'm a UPS driver. Wow. Laugh even harder. And I'm like, what, what? And they're like, oh man, you're, you're freaking hilarious. Just take this. So my friends, damn you to take the class. I didn't think I was nearly as funny as people in the class. I thought they were freaking hysterical. But then when I went up there, it went well. It was like six minutes in front of 200 people. And the first laugh I got like, I went deaf. I was like so nervous and excited. I went, I, went, I couldn't even, I heard like, ooh, like for the next, <laughs> I'm telling the next joke. Well, I, I'm like, and I could Wow. That's how I was like, I was like, holy shit. You blacked out. You looked down. You were rock hard. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's nothing like it. Like, I, re I remember my first big show in front of an audience was comics, like the old club on 14th yeah. Street. Elsie. Yeah. And I just remember, like, my mom was kind of sitting at a table, kind of in the front row. Like, the, 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 it, was, the, it was seated, like, kind of in a semicircle but i just remember like seeing her there and being like so anxious and just i just remember like the lights being on me and feeling hot and i remember like i had to have stuff written on my hand because i just was like i don't know how i'm gonna get through this whatever it was like right six seven minutes set it's so funny when you're first starting out like every minute matters you know um, and now it's like six and basically uh, like they would say an audience doesn't even learn your character for three minutes. Wow. So now you you build up to the three and then you have three more minutes to make them laugh. And then they're like, all right, get back, get out of here. Yeah. The only time I was ever at comics was hilarious. I went there, I walk in, I was doing like an eight minute thing or I don't even know where the hell was running. The show. It might've been the, what the hell is that? I don't know, it was that redheaded guy whenever he was running shows there. Ingle? No, no, oh, not Andy. <laughs> And uh, I go in there with my ex-girlfriend and we see um, Greg Giraldo in the bar. So, of course, I'm freaking out. So I'm like, going to open mic or a little shit. I'm like, God. I'm like, you, I'm like I, hand, I hand the phone. I'm like, you got to take a picture of me and this guy. I got to get a picture of this guy. So I get a picture with him. So I'm all excited. I, the show starts. I go up. One of my jokes was like really cheesy. I don't even remember it. So all of a sudden, from the back of the room, you just hear, Ugh. <laughs> I got yucked by the back of the room. And then when I when I, and I was like, all right. So I'm like, oh, I don't want to get frazzled. So I just kept going. And when I came off stage, I walked over to my ex goes, remember the guy you just took a picture with? He's the guy that yucked you in the back. Oh, my God. I called Yucked up, by Greg Giraldo. On the phone. And I'm like, Greg Giraldo just went, yeah, to one of my jokes. And he's After like, you were so, like, fanning out on him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh man. So heartbreaking. <laughs> That is heartbreaking. Oh my god. I I don't know if I had any early like like as a, as an open micer was I like a big fan of anybody. I just I remember early on like Adam Hunter, like I remember his name and face and I was like, okay, I knew he was like doing stand up and I was like, okay, maybe he was from Long Island too. Um but yeah, I took a class too like after college with a uh, what was her name? Judy. She wrote the comedy bible. What the heck was her name? Oh, I don't remember a name, but I think I have the comedy Bible. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, same thing. And I, I think I even took, maybe I took a comedy class like with my mom too. And the same <laughs> thing, like, like you get up in front of Gotham, and I, I was like, oh my god, I had like short blonde hair. I just like wasn't myself yet. I hadn't grown into like my real person yet. It just was too early, and I think that's why stand up was so intimidating for me early on because I just I wasn't like who I was yet. I wasn't like a fully formed person and you're doing open mics like it's so funny you're like oh i was like this little shit open micer we i always think of open micers of like guys in their early 20s but you were like already a fully uh, formed adult grown-ass man four. how old were you 34 when i started i wish i started when i was 22 wish uh me too yeah i was 26 which 
I just I I'd spent a lot of years doing improv, which I ultimately helped, I think, my stand up. But um, it, it was like rough. It was just a lot of I spent so much money. I could save a lot of money just by starting stand up, you know, the fucking I didn't need to be passing the clap for five years. <laughs> yeah. But, and you probably heard that UCB, you know, Saturday Night Live would come to UCB. So. Oh, of course. You know, That's why we were all there. Yeah. And I was like, short of like sucking a teacher's dick, I was like doing all I could to, to be noticed by uh, the SNL scouts or whatever. But, I, you know, I wouldn't go the extra mile. <laughs> um, Yeah, you mentioned Tina Forte. How did you meet her? She, when she started blowing up, I like made a comment on one of her videos. I'm like, you are so fucking hilarious. I love nothing better than honesty. And then she like wrote back, you know, I've been following you and Gallo for like, for, like before Trump. Wow. I, I've always been like a lot of comedians, like, like went like right when Trump came in. I mean, he was like the, he was like the right wing thinking comedians dream. How he just came in and you're like, you don't like it. I don't give a fuck. Don't wait. I'm going to say it. He was honest and but people I, needed that like this for years and years and years like so i was already doing republican kind of shit before trump even came down the escalator so i'm like you you have you've been following us i'm like holy shit so then she goes yeah we got to do a video so i drove up to yonkers and i like, met her by the water somewhere by the docks and <laughs> I, we did a video where i was just like teasing her because she hates michael rapaport like i do yes yeah they they got into some beef yeah so I found out that they are the exact same age and they're both Pisces. So wow. I, I, I have to, I didn't even tell her. So I just turned it on. I'm like, Hey, you guys are a love match. Hey, you're both, you're both 50. You're both Pisces. And she, so in the video, she's like, I'll fuck you. And it was, she really got so mad. Yeah. Funny. And then she wanted to do a video with Danny, the Democrat, my, my little alter ego character. I do make a fun of libs. So we did two videos, like one take each. And then just walk back up from the water, got in our cars and say, great to meet you. And that was it. And then we were supposed to do some giant thing on New Year's Eve with uh, Paul Bond and George Gallo and Mike Keegan and and her. She was going to be in it. And then the whole thing fell fell through with the theater we were going to. Uh, are you a Long uh, Island guy? Yeah, right in the middle. By, my, right by McGuire's. Oh, are you from Long Island? Yeah. Oh, what part? Farmingville, like right in the middle. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm from Rockville Center. Oh, uh, I was born in Rockville Center. No way. Mercy Her Hospital? Mercy Hospital by uh, Southern State and Peninsula. Me too. Oh, my there. God. We're born in the same hospital. What room? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's so wild. It was 1972. It's probably a janitor's closet now. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's wild. I, uh, I, The house I grew up in. Uh, it was is very close to Mercy Hospital. It's on. It was on like Reeve Road, and my backyard was literally Malloy College. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. I would like look over the fence when I was like really little. I'd be like, "Ooh, when I grow up, I'm gonna go to Malloy College." And then when I was like actually 17, I was like, "Oh, I want to. <laughs> I need to get the hell away from these people." But I didn't go that far. I just went to Connecticut. So right on the other side of that Echo Lake is a, a Lakeview section of West Hempstead. My parents grew up there. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, wow. that's what my yeah. dad grew up in West Hempstead that's or like South Hempstead, whatever the whatever the poor part is. I forget. Um, <laughs> he's from like the trashy part. Well, the day, um, regular Hempstead. And regular then, Hempstead. At least it's not Baldwin, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so did you start when you started doing comedy? Were you hitting up more of the Long Island clubs at first? Yeah, well, I took the class, so I was hitting all the uh, all the open mics around Long Island. There's tons of them going on with the bars. Will Vote was in L.A. now. He had one. And Billy Bingo had one. And Mike Dillon had one. And B McGuire's had their own. And Governor's had their own. So I was hitting all those. But I got really lucky because Carrie Caravas introduced me to George Gallo, Paul Bond, Keith Anthony, Chris Roach. So the, I, they started like, oh, like, hey, we're going to take you to Bristol in Pennsylvania. So I would, it would, I would jackass all the way down by Philly and do like a six minute spot. That's I, really great. There was an old, the, the old owner there was this lady, Joy Little, and she was a little abrasive and, but also honest, which I loved her. And I go, thanks a lot for the opportunity. You know, you know, you know Keith took me down here and she goes, you need a lot of work. 
It seems you like it when like a woman is giving you tough love. <laughs> I think you like strong, abrasive women in your life. <laughs> I, I just love honesty. That's why I refuse to like, like when someone will see me, they go, oh, I really like to put me on my show, but you know, you, you, you're a little like, abrasive and we, you know, be nicer if you, if you were a little nicer. I go, if I was nicer, I wouldn't want to do this. This is my yes. This is my therapy. That's what I, I I can't afford to tell my problems to some doctor laying on the couch. So I go up there with a bourbon and I just yell at people for thirty to fifty minutes and that, that's it. Yeah, I had a therapist. I just broke up with her because I I think our politics were starting to get in the way. Like she she I could tell like early on in the early days of Trump like was not into him but then like I kind of turned like in 2018 uh like I think my mom died I I just became awake like I got I got super like red pill just everything opened up and like I was just I saw the light and uh she, you know she just was like oh I hate Trump and I was like oh interesting you know and then I started talking about how I was there on January 6th and I felt so judged <laughs> and uh and then the fine the straw that finally made me break up with her she was like she wanted to raise her rates and she was like you know I see a couple who makes more than you and they're paying that and I was like I think I'm good I think I'm healed <laughs> oh my God. I think I've graduated therapy um but it's good. It's I agree so much with what you said. Like we don't need nice people to be comedians. Like everybody is nice. Like everybody at your job is nice. Everybody, you know what I mean? Like we need truth tellers. That's the job of a comedian, especially this sounds so corny, especially now more than ever, because like our news media is, is compromised. They're totally bought off. Our scientists are compromised. They're paid for our politicians are compromised. Like, yes, comedians are not the smartest people. We, but, but we're not compromised, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. I, I don't even understand how, honestly, I don't understand how a, most of the comedians in the tri-state area are, are leading left because they're attacking freedom of speech. Now it's the only thing that we have as comedians, but, being yeah. able to what we want, and they are literally voting to make their career more difficult. It's insanity. They don't realize it because a lot of them are so like either they're actually young or they're mentally kind of young, like haven't lived enough life yet. You know, they're kind of like uh, sheltered or whatever. Um, they don't see it because they're to them. It's like, well, they're team one, their guy won and yeah. uh, fuck Trump. He lost. So they don't see past that. Yeah. But I don't think that they, they have, they hold a lot of stock in what their friends think. So if their friends are all, brainwashed left from Don Lemon and all the horse shit. He's, Ugh, he's so and, gross. And they can't, even if they maybe think that way, they'll be like, well, I can't let anybody, I don't want, I want to, I don't want my two black friends to think I'm a racist. Like they just so stop your bullshit. Yeah. And it's like, are you are you on this earth and are you given this this gift, you know, and your passion to pursue comedy just to worry what people think of you, just to worry what you're like exactly like 10 friends in New York City think? And it's because it's it's not in line with what the rest of the country thinks and is laughing at and finds funny. Uh, since Dangerfield's closed down, I have no zero interest in going into a club in the city. I know you go in there. I know. I, I feel you. I, I nope. like. I'm fine with a couple things on Long Island and I mostly do the road because you go to Ohio and Indiana and Virginia and yep. it's real uh, people. 98. Nobody's triggered. No, you don't, you don't have some chubby lesbian in the back. I'm, I'm going to write a blog and ruin this guy's career. Cause I, he said the word Puerto Rican. There's always <laughs> some kind of a thing. I just don't understand it. Like, and back then it would be like some skinny hipster leaning against a brick wall with his Birkenstocks complaining about George Bush. And now they're doing the same jokes. They just insert Trump here. Like, you're so boring when you're leaning on your pole. Yeah, he's Nazi. <sighs> they're just like, ah, oh, jizzing all over themselves. They're so happy. This guy's brilliant. He's brilliant. He hates Trump. What a I know. We've guy. never thought of it. Yeah. It's unbelievable i just watch it. i'm shaking my head i'm like N it's not funny it's not funny if it's funny it's funny but it's mostly the time it's just mean-spirited and unnecessary and uncreative uh, ever will go after the other guy 
Meanwhile, this guy is a fucking coconut head. He's got six <laughs> brain cells. Terry, it, I I he, love oh, this t- person. Every yeah. Planet Earth. I love this tweet, and I can't believe how old it is. It's still your pinned tweet, but it's so damn true. The Democrat <laughs> hatred and violence you're seeing has nothing to do with Trump. Their rage is entirely about having been ousted from power. The Democrats want power. They'll do anything to get it. The Democrats are the people our Constitution was designed to protect us from. Like, yeah. whoo! I mean, it's <laughs> you're probably leaving this up here like, damn, this gets truer and truer like yeah, every well- few months. My most liked tweet, so I just leave it there. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it's like they certainly. Uh, I mean, yeah, anything. Like, look, look, look what happened. They, they did. look what happened. Yeah, the the impeachment didn't work, and they go, "Let's go to Plan B." Mm-hmm. Iris. Yeah, it's wild. Even even as these uh, the Fauci emails come out. It's amazing. Like you would think, like, oh, all these people who were <laughs> sucking Fauci's dick and voted for Biden. It's like you'd think they would come too and read some of these emails and be like, but it's wild. Like, I think most of these people haven't. And and the, the mainstream media that they've been watching that's been brainwashing them this whole time isn't talking about any of this stuff. So it's like when we say, like, oh, aren't they uh feeling dumb now? It's like they're not, because they're not even seeing this stuff. Yeah, I had a tweet and a post last week and said, it says, says hashtag Cuomo, hashtag Fauci, uh, Fauci, and it says, start listening to me. I am a fucking fortune teller. <laughs> yeah. For the last year and a half, I've been shitting all over Cuomo because he's the he's a disaster, Cuomo. An absolute disaster. And I have friends who are like, oh my God, he could be the next president. He's a Ugh. And then all of a sudden it comes out that he's killing old people. And he's fingering interns at a fundraiser in Buffalo, and all this. Other, what? You know, like, he's fingering interns. Yeah, well, you know, like all his Me Too fucking, you know, oh uh, boy, like, yeah, like backing women into a corner at some fucking three hundred dollar dinner dance or whatever, and he's just a disgusting creep. Governor he- nipple rings, and then he, they, he, then he came out that he was a piece of shit. Then last week, Fauci came out. And all my friends happen to like, on Facebook happen to love both of those guys. And I'm like, I told you, I've been telling you this since two Aprils ago. Mm-hmm. Both pieces of shit. And you love them. You love them. They, I don't get I, it. They're not attractive. Like, I could not understand. Not watching the news. Yeah. It fucking melts your brain. It really is. It's like, I've never been, like, big into watching TV. It's just like... I feel like I always have something to work on or do. And it's like, if I'm going to like dick around or check out, like I'll listen to music, I'll go masturbate. Like I'm not going to just like turn on <laughs> the news because it makes me anxious. So I just sort of have been phasing it out over the last 10 years, really. And it's it's so true. It's like the people who are glued to the news. It's like they're they're feeding their own anxiety. Oh, it's yeah. just there's no solution to it because there's not like, all right, I'm all caught up because it's not it's not designed to keep you up to date. It's designed to keep you afraid. Oh, yeah. It's all it's all fear spreading. Even I, I sit here with Fox on all day long. Now all I watch is Tucker because the rest of them are just shit to me. Yeah, same. I watch him because he's sarcastic and really funny. So I laugh. Yeah. I watch Tucker. It's like I'm watching like a Trump speech or a stand up special. I, I, I laugh the whole show. Yeah, he's show. good. Doing something about Kamala the other day, and they're like, they're, they're trying to show like all, all these like public access networks around here in the city and New Jersey. So they have these like these little black girls painting paintings of Kamala, and with with little little wings on, and they're like, oh my god, oh, Asian American, and she's the first African American, she's the first woman in the in major national office, and and, and t- they come back, and Tucker's just like this, and he's like. <laughs> If you see someone walking on water across your pool, it's probably Saint Kamala because she's a god now, apparently, according to it's it's unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, it's like merit, standards, quality doesn't matter at all. It's just like you fill you fill in these categories. You're diverse, you're a woman, you don't have to be good at your job. Yeah. That all they do is dice up things. It's amazing. They will always say oh, a person of color. A, a, a gay guy, a lesbian. Uh, all you're doing is segregating every single time. It's, it's on news stations. When they're not uh, shoving this vaccine commercials up your ass, then they're constantly trying to separate us into black and white and gay and straight 
and, and this and that and, and religions and stop dicing everybody up. It's like, I'm a person and you're a person. You don't have to be like, oh, Terry's not a person of color. Chrissy's not a person of color. We're just people. We're all people. And they always do that. They're falling right into the whole segregation shit. Yeah. And, and regular people don't care about any of that shit. It's like, no, it's the people in charge like that are obsessed with it because they want to divide us up. Like, like you said, you barely have time because you, you, you have all kinds of podcasts and you're on the compound and you have a stand up career. And I'm, I'm doing the same thing. And I'm, I'm trying to keep up with social media and not go to jail. So <laughs> I'm going to sit there and go, oh, yeah, let's think about the social consciousness of the races. And the, I don't have time. I yeah. don't. I'm to hate someone because they don't look like me. I have no fucking time for it. None. I'm about to get in my car and drive to Philly and tell dick jokes and hope to sell 10 t-shirts. Like I don't, yeah. have, I don't have time to hate. Right. It, it's the same thing. It's like, we have a job to do. It's like, yeah, what am I going to not do the room in Wilmington, Delaware? Cause it's 90% black. It's like, Oh no, that's like actually the best room to do because they will let you know right away. If you suck. I said that. My favorite comedy club in America is the funny bone of Virginia beach. Cause it's 70, 30 black. And the 30 is Navy personnel, which is good for me. Oh, wow. But the 70 is black and black people don't get offended by shit. It's white soccer moms that ruin comedy. <laughs> I have to agree with you. Yeah, it really is. Black people don't. They, they're rolling down the fucking aisles that come They roll on stage. They'll give me high fives as I say something crazy because they could, you know, those stages low. With it. I'm like, this is the best fucking comedy club I've ever been in just because of the demographic like you. Is it, you know, I, I hate doing all men or all women or all one color. I mm -hmm. like white and men and women. You, you need that. Like, like how many police fundraisers I've done where it's just a bunch of white cops and it's like. It's hard to do. Oh, they're the Why are cops hard to I, make laugh? Cops, I back the blue all the way, but because they sit in the audience and they go like this. Huh. They're tough because th maybe they feel like they have to be tough for each other. I, like a perp. <laughs> I laugh. <laughs> I feel like I'm being like, oh, meanwhile, firemen, best crowd. Really? Oh, my God. They're, their wives are drunks. They're drunks. Everybody's just slurping beer and laughing. <laughs> my favorite comedy show in the whole business is anytime someone goes, firehouse. Before they even say the price, I'm like, I'm there. <laughs> yeah. I did a firehouse show with Rich Carucci. It was a few years oh. ago. It was one of the most fun. I they had this huge buffet all the food they let me get in the trunk the truck and honk the horn yeah. i mean it's i had a low cut top on i knew what i was doing but i was just like this is so much fun <laughs> yeah, yeah they know how to party scrutchy firehouses yeah i think that's at first i was like oh long island is like such a click but i i, I think my the opinion of like long island comedy scene is better now because i've like performed in more of the country and long Island is like kind of similar to Jersey. And it, and then you realize Manhattan and Brooklyn are the bubble. Like the, uh, yeah. they're at the ones that are kind of out of touch. Yeah. Because every, yeah, everything else, if I go, Oh, I haven't done Brooklyn. You know, it's Freddie's back room. Ooh, like I would need at this point to go to Brooklyn. I know like there's this new spot. What's God. it called? I forget the name. I forget the name. There's this like hot new spot in Brooklyn and my friends have shows there and I'm just like, Oh, I don't know. Yeah, well, some of the guys I go on the road with, they're like, yeah, I'm going to spot them. Like, I couldn't even, I wouldn't even do it. You'd have to give me a lot of money, and I know it wouldn't go well anyway, so I would just be going in there and selling myself out, and I'd go on autopilot as I'm being fucking heckled by people with purple hair, and then I would just get the money and walk out. But it yeah. would be fun. It wouldn't be fun for me. No, I think I would. it would devolve, my set would devolve into my just like roasting each individual person. <laughs> just trying to make them like cry. Well, the reason I love uh, Dangerfields was Tony Bevilacqua, the owner. He uh, he came over to me one day and he's like, he's like, your energy's so high and you're so freaking ruthless and crazy. You, have, you like, anytime you come in here, you have to go at the end. You have to go at the end. And I'm like, oh, this is great. And he's like, I'm like, this is amazing. He's like, he's like, yeah, you remind me of, like these guys, like the guys in the late '80s. He goes, you just, you just don't give a fuck what anybody thinks. And then when the, when the crowd turns on you. You turn, you fucking pick them apart. Because I would do something and I go, oh, no. and I'm like, oh, yeah, I hate fun too. Let's do <laughs> misery. And I just, just, I just fucking attack them back because it was like, 
what are you doing? You came to not only the first comedy club in America, fucking Dage Fields, but like one of the best of the time. It was so cool. You, it's, it, it's not even a stool day. I would just put my scotch on the piano. Mm -hmm. all, those, all those little red mood lights. It was so, it was so like Rat Pack. I loved it. <laughs> oh man, it was. I remember I like I auditioned there, and I I think I was passed because the guy was like, "Send me your avails," yeah. uh, and then <laughs> then then COVID. So it's like, all right, that's that's pretty that's pretty funny, but now it's shut down, which is so sad. It's um, fun. do you do you attribute like your sense of humor? Like, were you kind of always this way? Like, do you do you feel like you blame your family and how you were raised, or more as you got older, your sense of humor developed? Um, I actually thanked them because yeah, I'm like I'm like a on stage I'm like a hybrid between my dad and my uncle who are both very out outspoken and uh like my dad's very sarcastic and witty and my uncle's very loud like loud mouth and obnoxious. But he would like stand up at Thanksgiving walk around and like, this sucks and this is bullshit and this is pus and and I would just sit there like that and then basically like four or five years later like I was, I was ranting around on a holiday, and my mother goes, "Oh my God, you know, you know who you sound like, and you remind me of right now." So, like between the two of them, I think, yeah, I just took, took, took his obnoxiousness and his sarcasm, and then I was just like, "Yeah, I was the guy in the bar that when I was sober, I was just silent and miserable, and then once I had three shots of Jameson and five, seven, and sevens." I was the loud mouth asshole that was like, yeah, like if I wanted like or chicken fingers, whatever. I'm like, yeah, I got your chicken fingers. And then we'd have some drinks. And it'd be like four minutes later, I'm like, yeah, where's the chicken fingers? <laughs> You're that guy. Yeah, so, uh, you guys chasing the chicken around? Would I stump the chef? Where's my fucking chicken fingers? And I was the loud, obnoxious asshole at the bar. So I basically just took that and built an act against into it. And channeled it into comedy. That's awesome. Yeah. And I just, now I just, Paul Bond says my act is a list of things I don't like. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's what <laughs> brings the passion out of people. That's where, that's where rants come from. Yep. Like if you're up there talking about what you love, you're, you're like a motivational speaker, you know? And like. Exactly. People are going to bond over, over what they hate. Um, do you, do you get the feeling with like fellow Long Island comics or is it more, you know city comics that there's this fear of of uh letting your politics be known because you will you know ost potentially ostracize some audience or some fa potential fans yeah i mean the, the city guys i'm friends with they don't really do any kind of anything political which is probably good for them but uh i can't help but do it when i when i used to go into like the grizzly pair I would do an anti, like a, a debunking a fucking the global warming joke right up front. And my friend Dave Harris would be like, what are you doing that for? I go, because I, I just, I know how this is going to go. So I'm just going to sell myself down the river right now. Basically, <laughs> um, and if you, if you don't like this, you're not going to like the rest. So go outside and call the babysitter now because it's not getting any better from here. And I, Yeah, that's good. You're just like, here's I, who I am. <laughs> I would basically screw myself. Like, all right, this is where it is. Yeah, you're like, I'm not going to talk about the weather or airplane food and then uh, make a right turn. <laughs> yeah, I think I did that at that, was at that Tribeca Comedy Club that years ago and in that, and I walked out. Oh, yeah. I fell. I'm like, this is not my place. And I walked over there and I'm like, yeah, I never believed in global warming. Yeah, actually, I do. It's the spring. Everything fucking warms up. And then, <laughs> or like, oh. And right from there, and then I'm like, all right, now let's go into another one. And then I did something about the wall or whatever, you know. Yeah, the Grizzly Pair, I think, is one of the few places in the city that I would, like, look forward to performing at. Because I just feel like they they do pack it in. And, like, it doesn't hurt that I'm, like, kind of friends with the guys who run it. Yeah. Um, it's nice to know, like, okay, you have a few pockets of, of places you can perform in the city. But, like... Honestly, like I don't know, I'm, you know, it's, things are starting up again, and I'm like, all right, am I gonna, am I gonna bend over backwards to perform in as many city clubs as I can? And I'm like you, like I would rather do an hour on the road. I would rather, like, I don't know, I just feel like you, you learn more, and it's like, at this point, like I'm not gonna be a like a fucking industry darling. I'm not gonna be a, um, you oh, know, out with the people you linked up with. You're, you're. <laughs> 
they're a pariah now like me. Welcome to the club. I didn't realize it. I just was like, because I started out woke and hating men and very feminist. And like I, that didn't really shoot me into stardom. So uh, not like I'm this is a put on, not like I'm trying something else on to get fans. Like I've grown into this person genuinely. Um, but it's like any fame that, that you're getting through pretending or by in, by being inauthentic like like i feel i really fear for the comics because i have so many comics like in my dms that are like oh like because they know i'm so outspoken about a lot of this like the shit that's going on and they're like i can tell they're afraid to like really let their politics be known or their beliefs be known even on like the jab you know because they don't they're just afraid of coming across a certain way and i don't know losing fans or losing their management i don't know what the fear is but it's interesting how many people privately will say stuff to me, but won't, you know, yeah. publicly. I mean, funny, I've had comedians going like, "Why, why do you let your your politics be known?" I'm like, first of all, like like my my regular friend page on Facebook, that's my life. You know what I mean? Like, you know, you know, I put, you know, I have pictures of my friends and my family and my fiance and freaking like you know, everybody, everybody like um in my life, my best friends. With, old high school pictures and hey happy birthday and blah 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 so they're like so of course when i find nancy pelosi to be a disgusting skell i'm (laughs) going to put up a a meme about it i'm going to because she's ridiculous and now she's so gross over she's the most worthless piece of shit i've ever seen in my life just so she's a lying piece of garbage so i have to put it up and my comic friends like dude you really shouldn't put that up and i go listen before I was political on Twitter, I had twelve hundred followers, and I have thirty six thousand. Mm. My fan page in, in Facebook, I have to have seventy thousand, and Danny the Democrat is twenty seven thousand. Before that, I had eleven hundred, and Danny didn't exist, and all I had was my friend. So, what what was it? when I wasn't political? What was I ready ready to break through with eleven hundred fucking followers? I wonder if it's projection, Terry. Like, I wonder if it's like your friends, like they're afraid to put themselves out there like that. Or maybe they feel a little bit as like you and I do. And they're like, well, I'm afraid if I am do that, I'll lose people or I'll be, you know, canceled or people won't book me. And it's like, yeah, after I got back from January 6th, I had so many retard New York comics being like, oh, let's make a list of all the comics who were January 6th. I'm like, it's a short list. It's me and one other guy that it doesn't really perform anymore. Oh, yeah. um, uh, about a year ago, I don't, I don't know if this was during COVID or right before it, there was some fucking brainless moron that was up way up in the, the, the top of Manhattan. Said a nobody fucking kid. I have no idea. I don't even remember his name because he's irrelevant. And he made some fucking Nazi list. I remember that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I used to like... And- I know who it was. It's Anthony. You were on it. I, <laughs> I didn't on, make it. I made it, and Gino Pisconti and Anthony. We were all Nazis. Bob Levy. Um, all the funniest Bob, people are Nazis, I guess. Fucking jerk off. He's nobody. And I'm like, exactly. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> and then I went. I went next. Time I went to the to the, the the compound. I walk in, and Anthony's laying on the like, leaning on the pool, and I'm like. Oh, what's going on? I'm, I'm your fellow Nazis showed up. Here's a bottle of wine. Yeah. He, ah, you're talking about that list. He's like, <laughs> who fucking cares? Yeah. I, the, I mean, like, and who is that on, on there? Of course. And who is that list for? It's like, are are you are the, are the clubs on the road going to see it and stop booking you guys? No, because you fill the room. The rest of the nobodies uh, uh, up in the top of Manhattan that do nothing and do 36 comic showcases and have nothing fucking going on zero and it's like okay well they're they're putting that you have to realize like there's so much of this is projection right like they've put that list together so that they can feel good about well at least i'm not with this group of people yeah and none of those people actually were you know have ever done anything remotely racist it's it's if if this guy saw like a trump thing of him doing this and it says winning he's a nazi Oh, yeah. Right there. It takes so little. Like I said before, like if you own camouflage shorts, like you're a Nazi. <laughs> if you own anything with an American flag on it. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think two of the guys on that list were actually Jewish. That's how intelligent this fucking Brent Dumbbell was. Oh, yeah. So these are Jewish Nazis. 
Okay. Very diverse. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. I think when you can realize that like so much of the shit talking in, in comedy is, and like, I'm not talking about our shit talking. We're just responding to like the people that come after us, of course, but it's, it's so much projection. It's like, they're like, well, they, they probably like, oh, wow, this person's successful. It must be because they're doing something wrong because it, it can't be me. It can't be that I don't work hard enough or I'm not funny enough or I haven't like cultivated I don't my brand or whatever. Yeah. Um, it's just like, I have to like is I have to constantly remind myself like not to take it personally because like they, these haters like they don't know you they think they know you like they oh. like oh you're on compound media you're a horrible person yeah this, oh yeah that's what i'm saying you, you linked yourself up with the with the devil now but uh. you know, <laughs> most funniest fucking guys in the business because jesus christ for like 12 last 12 13 years i idolized gino he's fucking so hilarious so honest that kind of shit like that gino matteris and those like de paulo like those fucking honest crazy motherfuckers that are so funny and they don't they don't care what anyone thinks i appreciate that so much it was i want to i mean i want to be lumped into those people that i don't give a shit it's funny i said like I, on a podcast yesterday i'm like you'll never cancel me because i don't fucking care i've had assholes that don't know anything call me a nazi a million times what they're blonde hair and blue eyes or what because i'm honest because i don't say what you want because i don't comply so I walk around and wear, put a tissue on my face to stop the spread and, and fucking, that, that's another thing that now I'm a piece of shit because I, he's an anti-masker. He was an anti-vaxxer. Well, I did the, I did the research on Moderna. You are the fucking research. Yeah. You research. You are the white rat with the pink eyes. <laughs> and, you are the test. You are, you are the white rat with the pink eyes. You didn't do the fucking research. And no, I don't fucking wear masks because it's pointless. Yeah. I vape. They'll put a, they'll, they'll suck in the vape, put a mask on and blow it right through. Really? So I got, I got to look like a fucking ninja when I go into Walgreens. It's so, insane. And like, even in the, there's still assholes driving around the car alone now in the first week of June. It's crazy. That's so crazy. I I'm blown away every time I see that. Even like, again, it's out. The Fauci emails are out. People can read Fauci saying early on, like, yeah, like, the, the classic masks that 99% of people have uh, do not work. The virus is smaller than the, 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 the can get in through the holes of the regular mask. Uh, and okay. he did that to dissuade people from buying them because he wanted the doctors and nurses to have them. Yeah. Awesome. They all have the, they all have their wallet into the vax now. So like, you know, we were yeah. 30, 36 more new billionaires in the last two months that popped up because they all went, Ooh, we're, we're telling you to wear the mask. We're telling you that the disease is deadly. Meanwhile, it's the glorified flu. Because if you yeah. look, look at the total death numbers between 2011 and 2021, it really doesn't. It doesn't. It, it, it didn't spike up at the end like this. Like like you know like like the gold prices in 2008. It basically stayed a, relatively around the same amount of deaths between those 10 years. Hmm. varying in between 10,000. So if three fucking million people died, wouldn't it conservatively spike up two and a half million, two million? No, it stayed right the same because COVID miraculously cured bronchitis, pneumonia, and the flu. Nobody died of this. The first year since the Middle Ages that nobody died of the flu. Oh, and did you hear that now they're not going to count... Uh, they're not going to mark if you're fully vaccinated, they're not going to count if you have COVID or not, unless you die. Cause it's like, I, I think they, they're just, it's, it really makes no sense. And I think it's because deep down, maybe they know that the, that the vaccine actually causes the variants to form because once a, like a virus always tries to find a way. And if you're, it's they're like, I've, I've been hearing a lot of podcasts on this and like reading up that like, the vaccine will actually cause these variants to form and they don't want to link it to that. And they, uh, it's, if, uh, if they can lie about the numbers, the real numbers, they can lie. They can lie about everything. They do lie about everything. It's, I, I, don't, I don't listen to a fucking thing. Any of these idiots say, I, I, I refuse because that that's their most powerful weapon is misinformation. So I refuse to listen to these morons. Like I said, I don't even watch Fox anymore. Bullshit. Yeah. CNN has been a fucking Fisher Price fairy tale. 
eight to ten years. Horseshit. Anybody thinks that they're listening to real dudes watching CNN? You need your fucking head examined. It's insane. I had a friend that guy was in a car. Uh, was on a motorcycle. Okay, during COVID, he basically got hit by a fucking truck on his motorcycle. So they brought him into the ambulance, into the hospital in the ambulance. I think his head was next to his rib cage and this arm was next to his leg. So he was in four or five pieces in the oh bed. Oh my God. Yeah. Cause of death, COVID. COVID. His wife is suing the hospital now. because they Really? Refused, they absolutely refused to take that off. She's like, my husband came in here in four fucking pieces. He did not die of COVID, but then the hospital and Cuomo will lose their ten thousand dollars each. So they re they refuse to take it off the death certificate. That's sick. It's disgusting, and it's disgusting how stupid people are for believing any of this horseshit. Yeah, just just by like your own common sense, right? Like if you've lived to be twenty something, thirty something years old, and and just like for me, like yeah, I've been walking around the whole last year, like barely wearing a mask, haven't even been sick. Like, yeah, I think I made it. I think I'm good, you know? Exactly. All last summer, I was in the road. I was in 13 states from June to October with Adam and Mike and Gary. Me and Gary are freaking sharing whiskeys. None of us are wearing masks. Yeah. You know who got sick? No one. No one. We came home, and then we got locked down again and tried to book a new tour. That's all that happens. Nobody. I never get sick anyway. I'm a smoker. I get bronchitis every November since I'm 15. End of list. I don't even get the flu. How much do you smoke? It depends. It could be like a pack a day. And if I'm drinking, it could be a pack and a half to two packs. Mm -hmm. But what, it, I, I never get sick because I think my organs are pickled from bourbon. Yeah. Maybe you have good genes. What's your background? Irish, French, Swedish, and Norwegian. I'm Hitler's wet dream. Oh my God. Yeah. I'm Norwegian and German. I'm like right in there with you. This is died, but yeah, maybe I'll go back to my Aryan roots one day. <laughs> what do your friends and family think of you? Uh, like your comedy career? Are they kind of like all on board? Like they kind of knew who you were out the gate. They were shocked because I was kind of, I was kind of like quiet and shy in elementary school. So my, my, my friends on Facebook that I went to school with were like, you were a comedian? You never said a fucking word. Because I was the kid with <laughs> yeah. a platinum white bowl cut that would sit in the corner and just like, you know, look like I, look like I was plotting someone's murder. I never talked to anybody. So they're shocked. My parents are supportive. They, they, think it's, they think it's cool. They will only come see me like once a year because my father goes, I want to see like, you know, I want to notice the progression. If you get Oh, better. God. Like that, which is it's just cool. It's yeah, just, that's a very dad thing to say. Yeah, he's like, oh, once a year, we'll come see you. But it's cool. Like, I mean, I, I know people that their wives haven't seen them on stage in fucking 15 years or they will refuse to go to the show and their brothers have never seen them and stuff. Like all, all my siblings have seen me many times. That's great. My The last time my brother watched my stand-up, I think I was uh, doing a festival in like Wilmington, Delaware, and he he and my mom came into the show late. Of course, it was like a showcase festival show. So it's like it's not like I'm doing a headlining set. I'm doing like a short set. They both came in drunk <laughs> with sombreros on. They had been drinking margaritas from down the street. They came in like both drunk, w wearing the hats. And then like my, uh, I think they were talking. My brother's only talking through my set. In the end, he was like, yeah, I, I didn't laugh at anything. I was like, all right. <laughs> I was like, thanks a lot. So not not a ton of family support, but it's it's like it's actually good. I feel like it's made me stronger. And in a way, it's kind of freeing because then I can talk all the shit I want. And I know like nobody what nobody in my family watches this podcast. <laughs> like they're not gonna maybe if my mom was still alive, I think she would be on it. She would just want to know what I was up to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my dad can't remember his iPad password, so I think I'm good. He's too busy working on his new girlfriend. So <laughs> um wow that's so neat uh so okay we talked about your favorite and least favorite clubs in this what clubs do you like the best on the road i love wiley's in dayton uh funny stop Ooh. uh cuyahoga falls it's just very it's very like old school i love it guy like books you on the phone page of cash Ooh. like a real like a real freaking book. And I'm like, uh, who do I make the check out to? And I'm like, oh, God, I'm going to get home with a check. I'm going to blow the guy at the toll booth. Money. <laughs> it's 
um, yeah, governors on Long Island. I love, I love all three of the clubs there. They treat me very well over there. The, the funny boat of Virginia beach is great. Um, yeah, basically I just worked at the Fort Wayne comedy club last month. It, it, it was pretty cool. Where's that? Indiana. Yeah. Indiana and Ohio. Are great. I just love it. I love Ohio. Triggered. They just sit down. It's so funny because the city comics will always go like, you know, hey, I went out to Indiana and a bunch of rubes didn't get any of my jokes. I'm like, well, maybe you shouldn't have done jokes about fucking Metro cards in Fort Wayne. How about, uh, yeah. <laughs> how about that shit, first of all, okay? They always come back to the city like, hey, they didn't get anything. Yeah, they didn't get anything because everything you talk you suck. <laughs> every, everything you're fucking talking about is Starbucks and fucking oh, Metro cards and all this, like, you know, like, oh, hipsters on scooters with a monocle. Like, nobody, nobody gets any of this New York bullshit out in indiana i think in the, i think the, the, what they call the rubes out in the midwest are way smarter than the people in new york because they can separate the fact that here's real life and here's mm -hmm. a, a comedy club about to be entertained and i'm not sitting next to my human resources manager so i can laugh at a joke if okay, someone says a joke about a puerto rican or a lesbian or a, or, or a freaking swedish guy or whatever the hell that they're they're mature enough to go okay my real life, I'm going to leave that outside. Right now, I'm going into a building with chairs and tables. <laughs> entertained. I'm going to laugh. And then I'm going to leave and go back to the real world. I'm not going to sit in there and go, I didn't like what you just said. It's so easy uh, if you just stay in New York City or Brooklyn. Like, oh, I'm in this uh, like rich, cosmopolitan, diverse, obviously all pre-COVID. Like, oh, this New York City, you you can so easily get into this bubble. Of, like, you think it's the best. You think you're better than other people. You think that, like, your harsh living conditions make you better. Uh, and it doesn't. It doesn't make you better or smarter. It's like, yeah, so somebody living in, like, an all-white neighborhood in Ohio. Like, yeah, just as smart, honestly. Like, yeah. And they're mature enough to separate, you know, the fact that we're in a comedy club and you don't have to be triggered. You don't have to bring your angry misery into a building that is supposed to be filled with joy. Yeah. And, okay. So don't make fun of those people being rubes. You're actually a pretentious elitist piece of shit who has to bring your social bullshit into a building that's supposed to be fun. Yeah. But are these, all oh, these guys, these hicks don't get anything. Well, they'll get stuff if you stop doing jokes about sh about streets in Brooklyn and Metro cards, and then come back and then yuck it up with your buddies in Brooklyn and go, "Hey guys, you did the end. I'm fucking rubes." No, you're a dumbbell because when, when I go when I go out on the road, I will walk into a hotel and I'll go, "What is the what is the rich neighborhood?" And they'll tell me. I write down. Yep. Is the hood? They'll. I'll write down the name of that town. Do you have an Olive Garden here? Do you have the? <laughs> I, I, I literally as I'm. It's I'm, so smart. It's so good. All right, I do my homework. And then when I go back to the room, I'm having a bourbon before my nap and the dip in the pool. Then I'll just work that into tonight's set because I don't want to do a joke about this kind of restaurant chain if these people have never fucking heard of that restaurant chain. Mm -hmm. Lazy fucks. They go out there. They don't get the jokes. The people don't get the jokes that the city comic's doing. Then they go back to the city and sit around and go, yeah, thank God I'm back here where everybody uh, really gets my shit because I was just down in Montana and gee, what a bunch of dumb fucks they are. <laughs> no, you're a dumb fuck because you're lazy and you don't do your homework and you went there and did a joke about a Metro card in Montana. So really, like these hotel concierge have a lot of power. Like they could make or break your set. <laughs> yeah, like if someone didn't have someone exactly, if they followed me but they didn't like me, they could be like, oh, I'm going to lie to him about everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah the, i remember like the horrible the horrible neighborhood in long island is called roslyn oh my god i think i was in it was like i think it might have been wilmington and this woman said that I, I think it was newcastle i forget i forget what it was but i like naively naively was like because the club was not in a great area itself i'm like oh newcastle that sounds fancy and then turns out it was like the number three most hood <laughs> terrible neighborhood and uh, so like I was really lucky. I said, oh, that sounds fancy, thinking it's probably not. And then that got a big laugh because I'm like, ooh, castle, you know. It is always good to know the neighborhoods nearby. Yes. I was in Spartanburg, South Carolina, which you would think very redneck. Um, no. Hmm. It, like, it was like Newark. Wow. And I came out of the club and there was some guy was there and he's like, 
He's like, can't believe you guys are having a comedy show here. And I'm like, why? He goes, it was three people got shot in this parking lot for two days ago. <laughs> yeah. Done with the cigarette. I'm going to go back in. <laughs> like, did you power hose the parking lot? Great. Back to work. Shit, dude. I would never know. Traveling is, around the country is so good because it does make you think like, okay, like if I move, if I move out, like I'll be okay. It's not like, you know, the, you think, okay, the rest of the country gets it. There's smart people everywhere. There's good cities everywhere. Um, that was important for me. Like, I think in my early twenties, I was like, yeah, New York city is like the end all be I'm from long Island. I'm like, okay. I went from long Island to New York city. And, uh, for, there were many years where I just thought the rest of the country like wasn't shit, but it's yeah. like, no, it's kind of the same everywhere. I remember like, like you see commercials and even TV shows in the in early eighties where everything was like route 66. And you think like it's, it's like Elmer's Elmer's fill up station. And like you, you drive across deserts and farms. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah. It's all flat and like no buildings. At Gala, we're like, we're in like shit town, Ohio. We'd pull over. I'm like, there's a Starbucks. Yep. There's a there's a, a a Dick's and there's a Panera Bread. They have everything that we have. Everything. Yeah. Every single thing, except they're nice to people. Hey, how you doing, y'all? You know, and they're polite. They don't just walk by. You the fuck in my way. Mm-hmm. It's like it, it really it bugs me when these uh, pretentious city fucks like uh, shit all over the rest of the country. It's like <laughs> these are the people that are smart enough not to believe Don Lemon. Yeah, Are it was it was very vindicating for, for me to see like over the last year. It's like, yeah, these New York City comics that shit on the whole country. They only perform in New York City or L.A. And guess what? Those are the two cities that are the most closed down. And now you don't have any contacts in the rest of the country. You haven't worked there yep. and you're kind of fucked. It was nice to see a lot of people quit comedy this last year. <laughs> I enjoyed it. It's quietly, you know. <laughs> Like, oh, it doesn't bring me joy anymore. It's like, mm, no, you, you suck. <laughs> yeah, well, before that, it was always be like, like the guy would always quit comedy that I'm like, why did he quit? He's fucking hilarious. And then there's like a guy you're like, you're like, why isn't this guy quit yet? Yeah. He never will. He just persist and persevere through everything. And I'm like, why the fuck is he kidding? Yeah, he's doing what he loves. <laughs> yeah. Um, Terry, it was so great to talk to you. You're a blast. I feel like we need to go have a drink soon. Uh, where can people find you, follow you, and uh, come to your shows? Well, if you're on Long Island out here with the pretentious New Yorkers, I'll be uh, at the Blue Goose Grill or something in Patchogue at, for Gateway Comedy. Ooh, Patchogue. The Gateway yeah, has like little offshoots now where they, they, they'll do stuff in a restaurant and a comedy club and a, a hotel and stuff. So that's the Blue Goose june 18th friday and beyond that um me mike and gary and adam for the multiple personalities tour we're filming we're filming we're uh planning another basically a three-week tour in our the midwest nice our awesome spot. yeah we're gonna be in wisconsin ohio indiana missouri all over the place so i, I and i love it out there i can't wait to go out there cheap cigarettes Ooh. And and nobody gets triggered and writes a blog about you when they go home from the comedy club. It's amazing. And that's the best of all. Uh, follow Terry on Twitter at Mac, M-A-C-7-2, Terry, T-E-R-R-Y. Uh, what's your Instagram? Oh, right, the new one. You keep getting no, banned. No Instagram. It'll no be Instagram. Fuck them. Terry McNeely Comedian, uh, the, the, the fan page on Facebook. Awesome. Terry, thank you so much for coming on the pod. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you.